Vampire Trail of Terror Written and narrated by Tony Capo Bianco It was 13 hours past noon. Special Agent Kono Castabello inspected the scene of the latest murder. The victim was a pretty young woman. Her pale, lifeless body floated alongside the reflection of the moon in the plunge pool at the bottom of Coffin Falls. The reflected image of the half-moon made it appear as though it was about to eat the remains of the victim. There was just enough blood in the water to make the reflection of the moon look like it was a crimson blood moon. This uncontrollable and unwelcome detail of the natural world added to the already unsettling and horrific scene. The town of Coffin Falls was named after this beautiful but dangerous waterfall located in upstate South Carolina. The falls themselves were named on account of its shape. The water cascaded down, giving the eerie appearance of a coffin. Tragically, the name of Coffin Falls also seemed fitting on account of the lives that were claimed there. Hiking to the top of the falls may have rewarded the hiker with a stunning view, but that view sometimes came with a price. The wet rocks were slippery, and at times one misstep was the last step that a hiker ever took. While one death caused by the falls wasn't a surprise, three deaths in one month was unusual. This, the third death at Coffin Falls, seemed to confirm Special Agent Castabello's suspicion. The previous two deaths were no isolated incidents or accidents. He thought that these were murders, and that they were committed by the same individual. To his mind, this had been the work of a serial killer. Not only did the details in this case match up with the details of the previous two deaths at Coffin Falls, but they matched up with ten other unsolved cases along the East Coast. As with the other recent unsolved cases, the throat of this young lady had been ripped out. Her body had been drained of all its blood. A macabre trail of thirteen dead bodies, drained of blood, stretched from the Hudson Valley of New York to upstate South Carolina. If Special Agent Castabella was correct, then this would bring the killer's number of victims up to thirteen. One thing in particular was different about this last death. Unlike the twelve previous killings, there was a witness. Adam Gabriel called 911 immediately after he saw his best friend, Lori Haddonsmith, plunge down Coffin Falls. I'm Special Agent Castabello with the FBI, he said as he flashed his badge to Adam. Why did you call 911? What did you see? My friend, Lori, was at the top of Coffin Falls. She screamed like she was really scared. I looked up, and then she fell down from the top of the falls down into the pool of water, answered Adam. Was Lori by herself up there? What was she doing? Agent Castabello asked with a firm, inexpressive look. Well, sir, she wanted to take a look from up top to get a memorable view. You see, Lori's big on making as many moments as possible, and she didn't want to miss this moment. She said that the full moon reflecting in the water below the falls probably looked gorgeous. She loved gazing up at the night sky for as long as I knew her, explained Adam in a voice that seemed very far away. Adam. Why weren't you up there with her? Tell me exactly what you were doing at the time. Sir, I was gathering some more branches to keep the fire going. We were going to sleep by the fire underneath the night sky, said Adam as he fidgeted with his fingers. Why tonight? Why did you come to Coffin Falls? 
asked Agent Castabello with the intention of seeing if Adam would keep his story straight. "We came out here tonight because it was a beautiful night. Lorry didn't want to miss any moments. She wanted to make memories and enjoy every bit of every minute. She was especially excited to come to Coffin Falls because she had only moved to South Carolina a few days ago. Adam explained with tears falling down his cheeks and over his mouth. Did you have a fight with Lori tonight? Were you sick of being just friends? You wanted more than friendship, didn't you? Agent Castabello pressed with a sharper tone that matched his sharper questions. Wait, what? No, it wasn't like that, sir. We were best friends. We didn't have an argument tonight. Lori recently broke up with her boyfriend, and she wanted to hang out with me to take her mind off of things. Adam said sharply. If you weren't intimate with each other, why did you move down here to South Carolina together? Agent Castabello questioned curiously. Sir, we decided to move down here for a change of scenery and to start over. I had gone to the University of South Carolina and I loved my time in the Palmetto State. The people were always so nice here. The sunny, warm weather often acted like a natural antidepressant. I often told Lori how great it was down here, so it was natural for her to want to move down here. After her ex-boyfriend broke her heart, it just seemed to make sense to move down here. She was going to waitress tables and look into going to college. Adam calmly explained as he wiped tears from his eyes. Adam. Your license says that you're from Junction Ridge, New York. When exactly did you leave New York? I left New York a month ago, and Lori got down here several days ago, Adam responded as he quickly ran his right hand through his black hair. So you've been down here a month? asked Agent Castabello. Yes, sir. That's correct. That's very interesting. Son... Did you know that there's a trail of dead bodies from Junction Ridge all the way down here to the South Carolina mountains? Questioned Agent Castabello with an icy cold look in his eyes. No, I don't know anything about a trail of dead bodies. Back in Junction Ridge, I had heard about some animal attacks, but what does that have to do with anything? Adam confusedly asked. Animal attacks, huh? So you think it's a coincidence that 13 young women had their throats ripped out and their bodies completely drained of blood? You expect me to believe that these murders just happen to occur wherever you've been and at the same time that you just happen to have been there? Agent Castabello, this is crazy. I have never killed anyone. I didn't hurt Lori, nor would I ever hurt her. New York. Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Victims were found in each of those states exactly when you were passing through them. We have the credit card receipts of the gas that you purchased on your trip down to Coffin Falls. While I was interviewing you, I had the Bureau look into your credit card statements. After I looked at your license and saw that you were from Junction Ridge, I made sure that we'd take a real close look at your travels. This can't be happening. None of this makes any sense. Why would I hurt strangers? Why would I kill my best friend? Why on earth would I call 911 to report a murder if I actually committed it? Adam said in frustration. I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like you were jealous. You couldn't stomach the fact that Lori was dating someone else, so you murdered the first girl in Junction Ridge. Ripping out her throat was your way of punishing the part of the human body by which Lori communicated her rejection of your romantic feelings. Unreciprocated love can crush the soul and unhinge the mind from reason. You got your first taste of murder, and you liked it. You killed four innocent girls in the Hudson Valley over the course of a year. Then, when Lori broke up with her boyfriend, you snapped 
because she still wouldn't see you as anything more than a friend. Already a serial killer, this final straw sent you on a violent murder spree. It was a killing spree that saw you murder five girls in half of a day. After that rampage, over the course of a month, you murdered three more young ladies, including Lori's murder here at Coffin Falls. The murder of Lori, the genesis of your rage, was the culmination of your fiendish work. As we stand here tonight, you've murdered 13 innocent young ladies. That's what I think happened, Agent Castabello explained as he stepped closer to Adam. I'm innocent! I had nothing to do with any of this. If Lori didn't die from an accident or an animal attack, catch the maniac that did this, angrily said Adam. This was an animal attack. It was a series of violent attacks committed by a member of the Homo sapiens. There will be justice for these homicides, said Agent Castabello as he read Adam his rights and arrested him. As Agent Castabello walked the suspect to the police car, he felt a chill go down his spine. For just a brief moment, he saw a pair of glowing red eyes peering at him from on top of Coffin Falls. He blinked his eyes, and when he opened them, the red eyes were gone. Were his eyes mistaken? Was his mind playing tricks on him? Or was it possible that there was some strange animal there? He couldn't be certain, so he had decided to ask some deputies from the Coffin Falls Police Department to do an additional sweep of the area. Something troubled Agent Kono Castabello. Everything seemed to fit perfectly. Too perfectly. Rarely did evidence match up this well so quickly. Then, too, the psychological element just felt off. Logic told him that his psychological profile of Adam seemed sound. Yet he couldn't shake the feeling that his assessment wasn't really sound at all. He had extensive experience in tracking, arresting, and interviewing psychopaths. He had interviewed dozens of convicted serial killers in an attempt to become a better criminal profiler. Adam didn't seem like a psychopath. Gut instinct kept telling him that there was something more to this case. Sleep wasn't possible for Agent Castabello so long as his mind was nagging him. Next, he did two of the things that made him a great agent. He followed his instincts, and he never put off things that he could do now. The half-moon was still in the night sky as he walked to his car in the hotel parking lot. Feelings of urgency and impending doom flooded through him like a rising tide as he drove towards the police station where Adam was being detained. Three sheriff's deputies were on duty at the police station when Agent Castabello walked through the doors. It was 3.45 in the morning. The sensation of impending doom increased as he walked to the jail in the back of the station. Darkness mingled with low light in the jail cell. A shadowy figure lurched over Adam's body. It appeared as though the shadow person was sucking on or biting Adam's neck. As he drew his gun, he ordered the shadow man to step away from the prisoner. The Shadow Man laughed maniacally and said, No, you foolish mortal, I give the commands. I'm not going to tell you again. Step away from the prisoner and put your hands up, Agent Castabello ordered. You have no idea what you are dealing with. You haven't got a clue as to what is about to happen here. You should have stayed in your hotel and gone to sleep, said the Shadow Man. As the Man of Shadows stepped closer towards the bars of the cell, Agent Castabello could see that this was no ordinary man. It appeared like a grotesque creature from a nightmare rather than a man. 
A demonic face with a large mouth and two large fangs grinned at him. Terrible red glowing eyes stared at him. No, those dreadful red eyes seemed to stare right through him. What are you? asked Agent Castabello as he kept his gun pointed on the hideous creature. I'm immortal. I'm a god, replied the creature. What are you doing to me? Why are you doing this to me? cried out Adam with a terrified look on his face. Since I'm about to wipe this FBI agent's mind of any memory of me, I'll tell you. I am a vampire. You left Junction Ridge at 6.30 p.m., and you arrived here at Coffin Falls at 6.30 a.m. the next day. I followed you all night, and I feasted on and killed young women when you stopped for gas or went to a rest area. I want to watch you suffer. It gives me great pleasure to watch innocent humans suffer. I will drink your blood from time to time so that I'll be able to taste your anguish. The blood of the anguished tastes bitter sweet. The world will believe that you are a serial killer. In fact, I'm about to make you a notorious serial killer. Momentarily, you will have fifteen murders to your name, and two of them will be police officers. But wait, it gets better. You will also join the company of Ted Bundy when you escape from this pathetic jail cell. Imagine the terror that will grip not only the town of Coffin Falls, but the entire country when the pathetic mortals learn that a psychotic serial killer killed two sheriff's deputies and escaped. After you are free from here, the trail of terror will continue, explained the sinister vampire. Two deputies came in after hearing the commotion. The keys dropped from the nervous deputies' hands. They were terrified by what they saw. Agent Castabello picked up the keys and unlocked the cell so that he could arrest this fiend and get him away from Adam. When the door opened, the creature moved faster than the eye could track. It grabbed Agent Castabello by the throat and told him to look into his eyes. Looking into the agent's eyes, the fiendish creature compelled him to forget that he had ever seen it, and then he told him to go to sleep. Then, with great violence, the horrifying vampire threw the unconscious agent into the wall. Next, the fiend did the same to the male deputy. The female deputy that came to the jail cell wasn't so fortunate. She had fired a clip into the creature along with her partner when he had lifted Agent Castabello off of the floor by his throat. The bullets had no effect. She reloaded and began to fire more rounds into the monster. Although her aim was true and her shots hit the mark, the creature seemed unfazed. The vampire ripped out her throat and drank from it until there was no blood left. The vampire then moved to the front of the police station to devour the second female officer that was on duty. So diabolical was he that he wanted to make sure that it appeared as though the serial killer kept killing only women even when his life was in danger. This would make people think that the serial killer was monstrously powerful. This massacre at the police station would turn Adam into a notorious serial killer whose legend would eclipse almost all others. The message was clear. Not even the police or the FBI could stop this serial killer. Terror would dominate and fill the news reports as various talking heads would discuss the massacre at the station. 
the vampire responsible for this trail of terror, wanted to make sure that evil captured the headlines, and that it would trend on social media. His goal was to cripple the country and the world with anguish and fear. With this in mind, the dreaded vampire absorbed the gunshots from Deputy Terra, and then he grabbed her by her throat with his left hand and slit her throat with his right fingernail. His fingernails were sharp as razors. Finally, he drank her blood as it gushed out of her neck. Always minding the details, he wanted to ensure that some blood stained the front of the station. The bloodstains were meant to add even more fear and revulsion to all who would see this heinous scene. In what he believed was his master stroke of evil genius, he took Adam's arm and made him write the following in the blood of the victims. The Trail of Terror Continues Signed, The Undead Terror, Tut The Vampire and Adam, written and performed by Tony Capo Bianco. The shadow of darkness dominated the room. There were no windows for rays of light to enter. The sun was not welcome here. Without a view of the sun, moon, and stars, it was impossible to keep track of time. Adam couldn't even tell if it was day or night, much less what day it was. Faint, flickering lights from a few candles weakly penetrated the blackness. He assumed it was night when the fiendish creature fed upon his blood, but it was so dark in his captivity that he supposed a vampire could move about freely whether it be day or night. Adam wondered how long he had been held captive in that dank, dark dungeon, but it was impossible for him to tell. All he knew for certain was that he was a prisoner of darkness. Sinister silence stifled Adam's mind. Not a sound was heard. There was no sound of footsteps. No sound of voices, no sound of rain or wind. A maddening hush permeated the cell, and any unfortunate captive held within it. Whoever said that silence was golden had never experienced the vile captive stillness of dread, derangement, and despair. Psychological anguish was Adam's constant companion. The death of Lori Haddonsmith, his best friend, would have been painful enough, even if it had been caused by natural circumstances. Seeing as Lori had not only been murdered, but murdered by a vampire, the anguish of loss was far greater. The fact that everyone believed that he had murdered Lori and twelve other girls further added to his mental misery and grief. In case those facts wouldn't be enough to break a man, the fact that he couldn't go to the police, even if he ever could escape this dark prison, further broke his spirit. The diabolical vampire had slaughtered two female sheriff's deputies and made sure that Adam would be blamed for that as well. It all sounded insane. Adam Gabriel might have believed that he was crazy, had it not been for a hellish fact. The fact that the grotesque vampire routinely fed from him made it impossible to deny that this was all a living, undead nightmare. Painful marks on his inner elbow and on his neck proved that this was no hallucination. Vampire bite marks puncture more than a person's flesh. They also pierce the soul. Escape was impossible. The dimly lit prison wasn't a basement. 
It was, in fact, a cave. The only entrance or exit was blocked by a massive boulder. Adam's strength had not wasted away, on account of the fact that his captor had kept him well fed. The vampire made certain that his prisoner ate, just as a farmer fattens up his livestock. Even with his full strength, Adam was incapable of moving the enormous boulder. No mere mortal could move that huge rock, not even an inch. Yet the infernal beast moved the giant stone aside with great ease each time he came to Adam. Like a rat in a cage, there was no way out. The sound of rock scraping against rock shattered the chamber of silence. Adam knew that sound all too well. It meant that the monster was coming to feed him and to feed upon him. While he didn't know how long he'd been trapped in this living hell, it had been long enough for him to have been conditioned by this sound. Shaking with fear, Adam backed up against the wall of the cave. It was as though he was desperately trying to enter the rock like a child nestling into a bush in order to hide from some terror. Ha ha ha! You are pathetic, puny mortal, said the vampire. Unable to hide, unable to run, Adam channeled all of his anger and fear into a blind rage. He sprinted directly toward the vile beast that had taken everything from him. He balled his right hand into a fist, and he launched it at the monster's jaw. The sound of paper being crumpled filled the room. The master had caught Adam's punch with his large right hand. He effortlessly shattered multiple bones in Adam's hand. Powerless, the captive was forced to his knees as he winced from excruciating pain. Fool! You're even more pathetic than an insect. At least they can bite and sting their attackers before they die, the master jeered. If you're going to kill me, just do it. Get it over with, said Adam with his head hung low. Life, death, everything in between. It's all up to me. I hold your fate in my hands. You are my slave, and I am your god, said the master as he let go of his grasp on Adam's broken hand. And fear ye not them that kill the body, and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell, Adam replied with his eyes fixed on the flickering candlelight. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Why does it surprise you that I have read your silly scriptures? Do you think that citing the gospel will act as some kind of magical incantation? Do you believe that it will protect you? Ha 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 ha! The master cackled with his dreadful red eyes glimmering in the dark. Continue to torment me, drain my blood break my bones. It doesn't really matter. You can do all these things to my flesh, but you can't kill my spirit. In fact, you don't have the power to even touch my soul. I'll never worship you. You are a disgusting devil, Adam responded with a new conviction in his voice. You are an imbecile. You know nothing of the things of which you speak. Where is your God now? Has your faith protected you from me? Did your so-called God save your precious lorry? No. No, your faith didn't help you at all. It's ridiculous. Your faith is folly, the master snarled. Rising to his feet, Adam replied, It is you who is the real fool. You think that you are all-powerful, but you can't make me worship you. 
You can't change my heart or will. This makes you angry. Your pride, along with your heinous deeds, will plunge you into hell for all eternity. With his left hand, the master vampire grabbed Adam by his throat, picked him up three feet off of the ground, and said, You know nothing. You, who don't even know how long you've been my prisoner, presume to know me. You believe that I came from hell, and that I must return to hell. Wrong. You say that you don't fear me. Lies. You are wrong about a great many things. The only reason that I haven't compelled you to worship me is because it pleases me to watch you suffer. Blood that has suffered and marinated in fear and despair is a true delicacy. Despite your pious religious recitations, I taste the fear, anguish, and despair in your blood. It tastes absolutely exquisite. Damn you to hell, you demonic parasite! screamed Adam. Flying halfway across the chamber, Adam crashed against the wall after the powerful vampire flung him like a rag doll. Squatting down, resembling a perched raven, the master began to speak again. Listen to me, my slave. I have a story to share with you. The world thinks that you were very busy again tonight. I chose another victim to add to the litany of kills that everyone believes you are responsible for. The media calls you Tut, the Undead Terror. I've made you famous. The press loves covering sensational crimes. They profit from death. I've transformed you into the most infamous serial killer of all time. Pathetic as I know that you are, they all see you as a living legend. They call you the Nightmare Man. The entire Atlantic coast is terrified. This fear in your name and honor ensures that millions of people have been marinating in fear. Millions of tasty meals await me and my children. Tonight was especially memorable. Listen closely, slave. A beautiful young girl, about 19 years old, left a church around 9.15 p.m. Allie was her name. I watched her get into her car. Flying above her vehicle, I followed her home. There really isn't anything as exhilarating as flying through the night sky hunting prey. As she got out of her car, the outside garage lights made her long black hair glisten. She had only taken two steps toward her house when I swooped in and carried her deep into the woods. Privacy is what I wanted. I had such fantastic games planned for us. After I dropped her onto the ground, she pleaded for me to let her go. At first she thought that I was the devil. Then she saw my big fangs. Fear washed over her face. She grabbed the crucifix from around her neck, pointed it at me, and told me to get back. I stepped back as though I had been hurt or frightened of her crucifix. A look of relief replaced the former look of fear. As she stepped forward in an attempt to drive me further away, I spun around and faced her. I put my right hand over the cross as she held it, and I crushed it like a toy. Pure terror resided behind her naive and innocent eyes. Her face had transformed from an expression of relieved confidence to a mask of frantic fear. I could hear the irresistible sound of her heart beating faster and faster. The sound of a frightened heart filled with adrenaline is like the ultimate dinner bell for a vampire. 
drinking that particular kind of blood is like the most euphoric drug or pleasure that you could imagine. Allie was about to be a meal that I would savor. Some young vampires will frenzy and drink a human blood bag dry in mere seconds. I, on the other hand, often like to prolong the dark pleasure. Prolonging it is precisely what I did tonight. I grabbed the girl's wrist and drank some of her blood. It was oh so tasty. Then I let her run for thirty yards or so in the woods, only for me to appear in front of her with my burning red eyes. So scared was she that she fell down. This time, I sank my teeth into her inner thigh and fed some more. After a few minutes, she got up and I invited her to run and scream some more. She acquiesced. I allowed her to run for about five minutes, and then I ended our game. I appeared before her and growled. She became paralyzed with fear. I then tore into her delicate throat with my sharp fangs. I drank the life right out of her. Not a drop was spared. Adam's eyes grew large as he pointed a finger at the fiend and said, You are a sick and twisted piece of filthy excrement. Oh, and don't worry, my slave. I made sure to leave one of your hairs on Allie's dead body. It's another number to add to your list of victims, said the master as he smirked. You will get what you deserve, you evil, rotten monstrosity. Heaven will strike you down one day, and I hope I'll be there to see it, Adam responded with a smoldering expression. You still don't get it, do you? Foolish mortal, I chose a devout Christian girl who had just left church to be my victim tonight. She begged your God to save her. She begged for heaven to stop me. She commanded me to stop while invoking her faith. How did that work out for her? I toyed with her, terrified her, and then I killed her. She meant no more to me than a chicken does to a butcher. Your faith is in vain, and now it's time for me to open your vein. Your heart is racing. I can smell your fear, anger, and despair, and now I want to savor the taste. The vicious vampire walked slowly towards its prey. The sound of Adam's heart pumping faster and faster seemed to put the blood-sucking fiend into a trance-like state. The unnatural creature became more and more consumed by the lust for Adam's blood. All of the vampire's maniacal manipulations had cultivated the desired fear, dread, and despair within Adam. This unholy trinity of emotions transformed Adam's blood into the kind of blood that is most coveted by vampires. The master's mind recalled how this tormented blood tasted each of the previous times that he had slurped it up drop by precious drop. It was as though he could already taste it. The prize would once again be his in just a few brief moments. The fiendish creature would savor the rotten fruit of its labor. Suddenly, the sound of rock grinding against rock broke the deadly silence of the chamber. The master vampire was so possessed by his bloodlust that it took him about half of a minute to acknowledge the sound. When he did finally realize that the sound came from the movement of the massive boulder which blocked the entrance, it was too late. A young woman whose long black hair glistened in the light of the full moon fired a wooden arrow from her crossbow into the vampire's unholy chest. Her blue mantle flowed in the wind. The back of her blue cloak had the insignia of a cross and a glowing sword. 
each of which fired a ray of light through a large serpent. Adam sat motionless in utter silence. For the first time in what seemed like an eternity, the burning fire of hope ignited in his heart. He didn't know who this gorgeous young lady was, but he was mesmerized by her. Ha 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 ha! The ancient vampire let out a guttural laugh. He then said, You brave but foolish girl! That doesn't work on me! You'll need more than a pathetic piece of wood to keep me down! The shadow of a tall man was seen right outside of the cave's entrance. As he stepped closer, the ancient master vampire saw that this man was also wearing a blue cloak over his black pants and black shirt. His cloak also carried the same insignia that his brave female companion was wearing. The emblem on the man's black shirt was a red circle with the words, Red Redemption spelled out in a clockwise fashion around the circle. A golden eagle was featured within the red circle. As the man stepped closer, the master recognized the man and his scent. It was Agent Kono Castabello. Stunned, the master ripped out the wooden arrow from his chest and tossed it to the ground and said, What is the meaning of this? How did you find me? How did you move that gigantic stone? How did you come to wear the sickening symbol of the Kaibo? They are extinct. Seems like someone doesn't have all the answers this time. I recall that last we met, you told me that you were an immortal god. Well, I'm not impressed at all, Kono Castabello responded while looking at the monster with a laser-like focus. You shouldn't be able to remember our last meeting, because I compelled you to forget me. No matter. I won't be as merciful to you this time. I'm going to rip you and your little girlfriend apart, limb from limb. Then I'm going to slurp up all your blood, said the Master Vampire as he snarled and flashed his large, sharp fangs. Raising his right hand, Kono Castabello revealed a cross that was adorned with five beautiful gems or crystals. It was once believed that these five crystals were meant to convey the five wounds of the crucified Christ. The master saw this and staggered back a few steps. He was in shock and disbelief as he said, No! No! That's not possible! It can't be. That's an Amon Ra cross. Even so, you couldn't know how to use it. Yes. Yes, it is. And yes, I do. Dance for me in the pale moonlight, replied Kono Castabello, as he shot the vampire with white-hot laser-like rays of light which amazingly emanated from the cross. Five rays proceeded from the five crystals adorned on the cross. Each crystal had glowed and released a blinding beam of heat. The scorching rays hit and went through the vampire's left shoulder. The master vampire shrieked with pain and flew out of the cave and into the night sky. Adam's captivity ended. He had been liberated. Adam, Kono Castabello, and the beautiful lady walked into the moonlight. Written and performed by Tony Capo Bianco. The FBI investigates vampires. A severe headache hammered away as Agent Castabello waited for the medicine that he had taken to kick in. His brain felt like it had been scrambled. The pounding pain made it difficult, if not impossible, to focus on the horrific events of the previous night. Making sense of his memory of the prior evening was like trying to make sense of a hallucination. What happened at the police station was insane. It was a pure sadistic nightmare. This particular nightmare was real. 
it really happened. Agent Kono Castabello had given his statement to the sheriff. His account of the bloodbath at the police station sounded utterly fantastical and crazy. Sheriff Rayland McMasters attributed the crazy recollection offered by Agent Castabello to the effects of a concussion or some type of significant head injury. At least that was his impression until the video footage was viewed. The police station in Coffin Falls had multiple cameras, and what they revealed was extraordinary. What in the hell? said Sheriff McMasters in amazement as he stared at the monitor in disbelief. What is it, sir? asked Deputy Cooper. I honestly don't know. Take a look and tell me, Sheriff McMasters answered in a faraway voice. The video recording was periodically broken up by static that looked like snow on an old cable TV. That static was strange enough, but what was in between the static and the clear recording was much stranger still. To be more precise, perhaps it was what appeared to be missing in the footage that was strangest of all. The security footage showed clearly the deputies, Agent Castabello, and the prisoner, Adam. It showed that a frightened deputy dropped a set of keys to the cell. Agent Castabello could be seen picking up the keys and then unlocking the jail cell. What was seen next made no sense. Agent Castabello had been suspended several feet above the floor for about a minute or so, and then he just seemed to go limp. It looked as though he was floating in mid-air while asleep, or as if he had been knocked out. Suddenly, the agent's body flew into the wall with great force. He then collapsed onto the floor like a man who had been knocked out by Mike Tyson. The creepy footage didn't end there. The same exact thing happened to the male deputy. The female deputy, who had also gone into the jail area, drew her sidearm and fired it into what appeared to be thin air. She could be seen reloading her gun. She had proceeded to fire more rounds. Astonishingly, the footage didn't show anyone else there with them. As this all unfolded, it was clear that the prisoner, Adam, was not the target. Then suddenly, blood sprayed the wall. The female deputy's throat was visibly ripped open. It looked as though some force was controlling her, but the force was unseen. Then, suddenly, her dead body fell to the cold floor. The security footage went on to reveal similar events in the front of the police station. Deputy Tara, who had been working at the front desk, could be seen rising from her chair as she raised her gun and fired it into what appeared to be an empty room. It looked as though she was lifted up from the floor by an invisible force. There was no one there. For all intents and purposes, it appeared as though she was levitating several feet off of the floor. Then her head tilted to the side as her throat was ripped open. A river of blood poured out. The torrent of blood sprayed splatter all over the walls, the floor, and the ceiling. The images were graphic, disturbing, and horrendous. Sheriff McMasters asked the male deputy who survived the attack the previous night what he had seen, but the deputy didn't recall seeing Agent Castabello that night. In fact, he couldn't remember anything out of the ordinary. Even after the sheriff showed him the footage, he couldn't remember a thing about it. Perplexed, the sheriff was about to question Agent Castabello further, and that's when a team of FBI agents entered the police station. The small swarm of agents were busy as bees, as they began taking evidence from the heinous events of the night before. They zeroed in on the footage from the night before and confiscated it. Outraged, Sheriff McMasters raised his voice and said, What do you think you're doing? You feds can't come in here and take evidence from a crime that happened here last night. This is my police station, and I lost two good deputies last night. A young woman wearing a black trench coat, a blue blouse, and black pants calmly and confidently walked up to the sheriff and replied, Sheriff Raylan McMasters, I'm Special Agent Lydia Marsh. I'm terribly sorry for the loss of your deputies. What happened here was a real tragedy. 
These murders are linked to a series of murders spanning up and down the East Coast. This is now a federal case. Pointing his finger at Special Agent Lydia Marsh, Sheriff McMasters responded, Look here, I don't mind working together with the Bureau, but I won't stand by and allow you to cut me out of this investigation. The girls who were slaughtered here last night were my responsibility. They were good deputies and even better people. I owe it to them to see this thing through, whatever it takes. Agent Marsh calmly and gently replied, I know what you're feeling. I understand. We lost 13 good agents to the monster that did this. Bringing him to justice is our top priority. The trail of terror left by this fiend is far more vast than either you or Agent Castabello know. This case is highly sensitive, and I have detailed orders of how to proceed with it. All of the evidence is going with the FBI. It will be stored in a highly secured facility. Having said that, I intend to fill you and Agent Castabello in. I'm sure you are puzzled by what you've seen, or should I say, by what you haven't seen so far. Sheriff McMaster's eyes grew wide when he heard that last sentence. He said, Okay, I'll hear you out. Let's go into my office to talk. The sheriff, Agent Cono Castabello, and Agent Lydia Marsh entered the sheriff's office and sat down. I'm sure that you both have a lot of questions. I suspect that you may both be questioning your sanity, too. Well, the good news is that you aren't crazy. The bad news is that monsters are real. And no, I'm not talking about metaphorical monsters. We believe that all of the murders linked to Adam, as well as the violent murders committed here last night, were perpetrated by the same vile beast. No doubt you noticed that each of the victims' bodies were drained of all their blood. In his statement, Agent Castabello already said who, or rather, what was responsible for this grotesque massacre. Sheriff McMasters interrupted and said, Now hold on a minute. You can't be saying that a vampire did this. Squinting her eyes, Agent Marsh replied, That's exactly what I'm saying. Shaking his head, the sheriff said, Come on, vampires don't exist. Have you watched too many episodes of the X-Files? Brushing the long, silky black hair from her left eye, Agent Marsh replied, the X-Files was a great show, but I assure you that it wasn't nearly as terrifying as reality is. The world can be a dark place, and real evil lurks and stalks in the darkness. The reason that you saw your deputies unload their guns into what appeared to be thin air is because a vampire was the target. Vampires do not cast a reflection, and they do not show up on film. The strange, flickering, snowy interference on the security footage was also the result of an unnatural presence, the presence of a powerful vampire. The reason that your surviving deputy doesn't remember anything from last night is because the vampire made him forget all about it. Agent Marsh, if that's true, then why does Agent Castabello remember what happened last night? The sheriff questioned. Yes, now that is a very interesting question. That's one of the reasons that I came here. When I heard about Agent Castabello's statement, I was amazed. In his statement, he explained that this master vampire successfully used compulsion to make the deputy forget, yet the compulsion failed to work on Agent Castabello. This is the first time that we have encountered anyone who has successfully resisted a vampire's manipulation of the mind. We want to explore this further, Agent Marsh explained. How long have you known that vampires actually exist? Are we supposed to say that vampires are murdering civilians and police officers? Sheriff McMasters questioned. The FBI has been aware of the existence of vampires for a number of years. No, of course we aren't going to tell the media and the public that a vampire is responsible for this bloodbath. Doing so would only increase fear and panic. People will already be frightened when they hear that a serial killer murdered two sheriff's deputies, knocked out another deputy and an FBI agent, and broke out of jail. We will simply state the facts while being very selective of which facts we release. Really, this is standard procedure for ongoing investigations. 
Therefore, we'll say that we have reason to believe that an accomplice orchestrated the tragic events that took place here, further explained Agent Marsh. People will want to know more. The media will hound us for details, said Sheriff McMasters. Of course they will. Stick with the plan. If you want me to keep you in the loop, then you'll have to earn my trust by cooperating with us. The choice is yours. You could tell the press what you've seen on the tapes and what we've discussed here. However, if you did choose to do that, do you really think anyone would believe you? Do you think people would feel or be any safer? Agent Marsh asked sincerely. This all seems crazy. I've seen evil things when I was deployed in Iraq, but I've never seen anything like this. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around all of this, but I think your plan sounds reasonable. I'll cooperate, Sheriff McMasters thoughtfully responded. Then I'll keep you informed. Now that you know that monsters do exist, you can keep your eyes out, Agent Marsh added. Agent Kono Castabello rose to his feet and said, I don't know whether I should be relieved or not, now that I know that I haven't gone crazy. What's my next step? Opening the door to exit the sheriff's office, Agent Marsh replied, You're coming with me. We have a lot to discuss. Riding shotgun in the black SUV with tinted windows, Castabello asked, Why hadn't I heard of a division within the FBI that hunts vampires? Glancing to her right to look Castabello in the eyes, Marsh answered, Moon Mist. It's a secret division that very few people in the government know about. It has to be confidential. We don't hunt vampires exclusively. We investigate unexplained phenomena. Okay. You must have known that I was tracking the murders along the East Coast. Why didn't you contact me sooner? Castabello questioned. We've been really busy. We intended to sit down with you soon. When we saw that you arrested Adam on suspicion of murder, we planned on coming to the police station the following day to interview him. We had no reason to believe that vampire would attack the police station. It seems as if this vampire is always ahead of us. He's always in control of events. He is extremely intelligent, and he's extraordinarily evil, Marsh explained as she drove in the rain. Where are we going? Castabello asked. We're going to GSP Airport to catch a flight to the Hudson Valley. That's where Moon Mist operates from. I have a lot to show you, Marsh said with a pleased look on her face. So, tell me more about vampires. Are they really undead? Do crosses work on them? Can sunlight or a wooden stake through the heart kill them? Castabello excitedly asked. Yes, vampires are undead. They have no heartbeat. They don't need oxygen. There is no scientific explanation for how this could be. We believe that magic makes it possible, and that magic governs the rules. A simple crucifix does not have any effect on them. A wooden stake through the heart kills most vampires, but it will not kill a master vampire. The sunlight, however, does destroy most vampires, and we believe that the sunlight will at least badly damage a master. Marsh explained as the windshield wiper scratched against the glass. Some of that doesn't make sense. Why would a gunshot to the heart not kill them, while a wooden stake through the heart does? Castabello questioned. You're right. If we think rationally, it doesn't make sense. Just like it doesn't make sense that a creature with no heartbeat can be animated. Nor does it make sense that such a creature needs blood to survive. However... If you think in terms of magic, then these things can begin to make some kind of sense. At least, insofar as any kind of magic can make any sense. Magic may stipulate that the vampire needs blood to remain as the living dead. Magic may determine that a wooden stake can kill a vampire when it pierces the heart. Whatever kills a master will likely also be determined by the magic that governs these supernatural creatures. Marsh mused as the rain poured. Why was I able to remember the vampire when the deputy couldn't? Why didn't the compulsion work on me? Castabello asked, while rubbing the tip of his thumb against the tip of his index finger. That, Mr. Castabello, is an excellent question. We haven't come across anyone who was able to resist the compulsion of a vampire, but I have read about it in books. 
an ancient book on vampires, written in Latin, tells of a people who came from another place. This people could not only resist vampire compulsion, but they had special powers. They had access to a magic which gave them extraordinary abilities. Some of these abilities resembled the kinds of abilities that Jedi and Sith exhibited in Star Wars. With these powers, they hunted and destroyed vampires, Marsh explained with excitement. That sounds fantastical. This is all so surreal. It's like I'm in a wild nightmare, said Castabello. The agents had spent most of the daylight hours at the police station. The sun had been down for an hour. The rain, accompanied by fog, greatly reduced visibility. That's when a loud bang was followed by the sound of breaking glass. A body crashed through the window. The airbags deployed and prevented the agents from serious injury. When Marsh and Castabello regained their senses, they unfastened their seatbelts as they heard a hissing sound. The hissing came from a vampire. It wasn't the master, but it was an undead bloodsucker. Agent Marsh took a wooden stake out from her trench coat. Without hesitation, she drove it into the vile creature's chest. The vampire immediately turned to dust. As Marsh and Castabello got out of the car, they quickly realized that they weren't alone. In the fog, there were two more vampires approaching them. While the vampire that Marsh slayed in the car had been a man, these two vampires were women. One had red hair that resembled the color of blood. The other had blonde hair. They were both wearing what appeared to have been white nightgowns. Their skin was as white as the fog. If the agents didn't know better, they might have thought that these were phantoms rather than vampires. Castabello's heart raced as he drew his gun and fired into the chest of the red-headed vampire. The bullets knocked her down. Marsh tossed her keys to Castabello and said, Here, open my trunk and take a wooden stake out of the black bag. Do it quick! As Castabello ran to the trunk of the car, the red-headed vampire sat straight up with her arms folded across her chest and then rose to her feet. The blonde vampire was moving so quickly that she couldn't be seen. She knocked the wooden stake from Marsh's hand and threw her to the ground. As the blonde vampire straddled Marsh, the red-headed vampire ran as fast as light toward Castabello and knocked him twenty yards backwards. As the redhead pounced on top of him, he drove the wooden stake into her cold, dead heart. As the stake pierced her heart, she exploded into pieces all over the road. Castabello felt a burning rage inside as he saw the blonde vampire biting and drinking the blood of Agent Marsh. All of a sudden, the blonde vampire went flying off of Lydia Marsh. She had been flung ten yards into the night sky and thirty yards backwards into a tree branch which went through her heart. Her body instantly burst into flames. The flames set the tree on fire. The mixture of smoke and fog added to the eerie, unearthly scene. Racing towards Lydia Marsh, Castabello tightly gripped the wooden stake in his right hand. He was prepared to put the stake through his new friend's heart in case she turned into a vampire. Looking at Castabello, she said, Put that damn stake down! I'm all right! I'm not going to turn into a vampire. A mere vampire bite doesn't transform someone into a vampire. There's more to it than that. You have to drink the blood of a vampire after they drink from you and drain you near the point of death. Of course, I knew that. Everybody knows that, Castabello replied with a twinkle in his eye. Holy shit! You are a descendant of the Kaibo! The legends are true! This changes everything! You're now our top priority, Marsh exclaimed. The Kaibo? Who are they? Castabello asked as he cocked his head. Remember those powerful Jedi-like people I was telling you about before? Well, you've got to be related to them. You just overpowered and killed a strong vampire using your innate abilities, Marsh responded as her beautiful blue eyes gleamed. Wait, are you saying that I used magical powers to whip a vampire through the air and impaled it through a tree branch? Yes, you did that. You, 
saved my life. So you're basically saying that I'm a Skywalker now? Well, maybe from a certain point of view you might say that, Marsh said with a smirk. Yes! This miserable day just got a whole lot better. Call the president. I'm a vampire-slaying superhero, said Castabello with a smile. Slow your roll there, cowboy. You may technically be a vampire slayer because you destroyed two vampires tonight, but you aren't a superhero yet. You're going to have to study and train a lot. We abandoned the training methods of the Kaibo because no one was able to do any of the extraordinary abilities spoken of in the book. There were two theories as to why the training hadn't taken hold. The first theory was that such powers were nothing more than ancient myth. The second theory was that one needed to have Kaibo ancestry in order to be capable of using the magical abilities. Marsh explained as she took out her smartphone to call the Bureau to inform them of the revelations of the night. Kono Castabello and Lydia Marsh stood in the illuminated area provided by the car headlights. They watched the fire burn as they waited for the emergency responders to arrive. On this night, a new light scattered the shadow of darkness. Hope rose with the dancing embers from the fire. The FBI Investigates Vampires Written and performed by Tony Capo Bianco. I hope that you enjoyed your stay here at the Haunted Half Moon Inn. The Master requests that you consider supporting me and the Inn by becoming a slave. I mean, a patron of mine on Patreon. The Half Moon Inn needs your support to keep the doors open. You wouldn't want the residents here to feel forgotten and abandoned, would you? Creating quality scary stories to share with you is very important to me. Running this inn of horror is a passion of mine, and I would truly appreciate your support. The world is hurting. It needs more horror. Help me to heal the world through horror. Together, with your help, we could haunt this world one home at a time. Until next time, always remember, just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they aren't there. <laughs>